Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Eatonson. Welcome to Heal NPD. So I have a confession to make. Until very recently, I'd never actually watched one of Dr. Romani's videos in its entirety. For one, I'm not exactly her target demographic, but for another, her way of conceptualizing NPD doesn't really fit with mine. But I decided to make a video about empathy, and I watched one of her videos on the topic as research. Suffice it to say that she and I have some pretty significant disagreements. Many people consider low empathy to be a central diagnostic consideration for pathological narcissism and NPD. NPD and lack of empathy are so fused in the popular mind that people often react with shock and surprise when I inform them that low or absent empathy is not actually required for a diagnosis of NPD. For a very large group of people out there, lack of empathy means narcissism, and narcissism means lack of empathy. And this is one reason I was surprised that Dr. Romani's video on the topic claims that individuals with pathological narcissism and NPD don't actually lack empathy. In fact, she makes the argument that people with NPD are actually gifted when it comes to empathy. They simply choose not to use it. In her words, they can't be bothered to extend empathy toward those with whom they're close. She says, and I quote, the most dangerous part is the narcissist weaponizing empathy. They have an unbelievable ability to study another person and get the information they need and turn around and use it to harm that person. Now, in my opinion, this perspective invites viewers to go deeper and deeper into a two-dimensional worldview in which the problems in their interpersonal relationships are caused by intentional bad actors, wolves in sheep's clothing who, quote, weaponize empathy. But is it correct? Is Dr. Romani right in saying that narcissists are choosing to weaponize empathy? In my opinion, the field needs to decide whether pathological narcissism and NPD actually represent a form of mental illness. And this is an issue I raised uh, way back in my first video titled The Problem with NPD. The diagnostic criteria for NPD focus on superficial attributes like arrogance, grandiosity, and entitlement. But notably absent are any criteria that focus on suffering or distress that's often experienced by individuals with NPD. The one-dimensionality of the NPD construct in the DSM supports stigma and public antagonism toward this population. Essentially, NPD as described in the DSM is the asshole disorder. If the criteria focused instead on deficits and impairments, including empty depression, anxiety, vulnerable or variable self-esteem, and even suicidality, I think we'd see a different treatment of this disorder. But which is it? Is NPD a mental illness, or is it a form of evil? Are narcissists suffering, or are they intentional bad actors who are out to get people? Are they secretly empathy geniuses, like Dr. Romani claims, who have simply chosen to, quote, weaponize empathy? Or are they actually impaired and unable to empathize, especially with those who are close to them, for reasons that have very little to do with conscious manipulation? Well, I think you all know my take on this question. Of course, there are individuals out there with NPD who intentionally hurt and manipulate other people, but I would argue that such individuals are likely good examples of malignant narcissism, which actually involves a combination of grandiose narcissism, psychopathy, sadism, and paranoia. I actually made a video about this personality style, and I'll link to it in the description. But as a rule, it's my experience that individuals with pathological narcissism aren't usually quote, out to get other people. Rather, they are often like someone who's drowning and desperately fighting for air, and such an individual will blindly pull those around them down to survive. The DSM itself is somewhat inconsistent on the topic of empathy. It says both that narcissists lack empathy, but then it also says that narcissists are unwilling to extend empathy toward those around them. Can it possibly be both? Well, I think the answer is yes, and I'll explain why. Here are the four main reasons for impaired empathy in pathological narcissism and NPD. Number one, lack of self-awareness. 
Narcissists are very sensitive to feeling shame, interpersonal dependency, or humiliation. This sensitivity causes them to disavow, repress, or split off vulnerable feelings. They're often shockingly unaware of their own emotional needs. And to an extent, this lack of self-awareness is due to deficits in their early relationships with caregivers. Many individuals with pathological narcissism and NPD were exploited emotionally by caregivers and pressured into developing a persona that was pleasing to those around them. This persona pretends not to have emotional needs. It pretends not to experience shame, doubt, longing, grief, or disappointment. As children, most narcissists were forced to drive such feelings underground, to bury them in their own unconscious, and to cover them over by a compensatory, grandiose, false self. We can't see in others what we can't see in ourselves. We can intellectually understand what other people might be going through, but to really empathize with them, we need to be able to find similar experiences inside of ourselves. And since narcissists tend to be defensively organized in such a way that they exclude those experiences from their own conscious awareness, they have a difficult time empathizing with other people. Number two, objectification of the self and of other people. As I've discussed in previous videos, including one titled Why Narcissists Feel Empty Inside, people with pathological narcissism and NPD don't typically experience themselves as a self. Instead, they tend to experience themselves as an object that's either doing well or that's worthless. This objectification of self is actually a legacy of relational trauma and the pressure to perform that many narcissists experienced in childhood. They were not raised in an environment where their feelings mattered. What mattered was how well they performed, how well they measured up to the expectations of a caregiver. They were used, treated as an object, and this experience became for them the centerpiece of selfhood. Empathy requires perceiving yourself as a subject, as a being with feelings that are valid and important and that provide meaningful context to your life. If you can't know about your own feelings, then it becomes very difficult to understand the feelings of other people. Similarly, if you can't perceive your own intrinsic worth as a subject, it's difficult to perceive others as worthy subjects. In pathological narcissism and NPD, everyone, the narcissist included, tends to be treated as an object that's either good or bad, shiny or ugly, valuable or worthless. There's little to no room in that mix for empathy, either for the self or for other people. Objects don't require empathy. Only subjects do. Three, narcissists are like someone who's drowning or someone who's starving. A sort of desperation underlies most of their experience, only it often doesn't look like desperation. It looks like pressure. Pressure to be the best. Pressure to have the best, pressure to be noticed, pressure to be seen. Consciously, many narcissists will disavow that they need anything at all because the compensatory grandiose self is built to defend against shame, rejection, and humiliation, and therefore any emotional experience that might render them vulnerable to one of those terrible feelings. You only have to scratch the surface of the narcissist's defensive facade to find a kind of depthless need, a terrifying desperation that's built on profound interpersonal dependency. Narcissists have a damaged sense of self that requires constant infusions of external self-esteem. Their ability to generate their own sense of worth, their own sense of meaning, and their own sense of self is impaired. They must borrow those abilities from those around them. And this gets us back to the metaphor of a drowning or starving person. A drowning person wants only one thing, air. And a starving person wants only one thing, food. All other considerations are subordinate to that overarching need. The same is true for pathological narcissism and NPD. We need a viable sense of self to survive. And when someone's sense of self is in a state of collapse, they can't focus on anything. Not work, not love, not responsibilities, etc. It all goes out the window until a sense of self is restored. Just like a starving person's priorities, 
all go out the window until they get food. In a starving state of mind, we're not capable of empathy. We can't place other people first. Try to rescue a drowning person and see how quickly they pull you under. There's a reason why lifeguards learn to extend a pole or throw a life preserver. Even the most admirable among us will clutch at someone attempting to rescue them from drowning in such a way that both lives are often lost. And number four, in my own research, I've found that pathological narcissism and NPD are positively correlated with something called dismissing avoidant and fearful avoidant attachment styles. Attachment styles are characteristic ways of engaging in relationships with other people. We develop them very early in life based on the ways that we're treated by caregivers. Those with avoidant attachment styles learn to sort of turn the volume down on their own interpersonal needs because caregivers are unresponsive, punishing, or inconsistent. A famous study looked at the signs of stress in toddlers who have avoidant attachment styles. When separated from their caregiver, these toddlers showed no outward signs of distress. They didn't cry, they didn't fuss, they didn't even tend to look up from what they were doing when the caregiver left the room. But medical readings of stress, like galvanic skin response, remained high. These children had learned to suppress their attachment needs. They were learning to ignore their own feelings. And longitudinal studies show that avoidant children often grow into adults who have something called a dismissing avoidant attachment style, which is most strongly associated with the grandiose narcissistic presentation. They tend not to communicate their interpersonal needs. They tend to downplay the importance of love in relationships. Like the toddlers in the study, they still need those things, but they've simply learned to repress their awareness of those needs, driving them into the unconscious. These individuals consciously avoid closeness and intimacy. And since expressing empathy is often a way of increasing or enhancing intimacy, dismissing avoidant individuals will tend to avoid doing so. This avoidance isn't to manipulate someone. Rather, it's to protect the person from experiencing their own attachment longings. Remember, these individuals learned in childhood that needing someone only results in pain or disappointment or unbearable frustration. And the vulnerable presentation of narcissism is most strongly associated with the fearful avoidant attachment style. Fearful avoidant attachment style is associated with mixed messages from caregivers in early childhood. It's also associated with trauma and with abuse. These are children who often exhibit something called disorganized attachment behaviors, like approaching caregivers backwards. It's clear that there's an intense conflict in the child between the need for love and support and the fear that it will be delivered in a way that hurts or harms the child. Adults with fearful avoidant attachment styles will endorse that they want to be close to other people, but that they're afraid. In many ways, this is the most problematic of the attachment styles because it contains both attachment anxiety and attachment avoidance. These individuals are worried that other people won't like them, want them, or accept them. But they're also worried that closeness will result in pain, disappointment, frustration, or abuse. People with this attachment style will often send mixed signals that reflect their internal conflict around closeness. It might look like being really into someone at first, but then becoming remote or aloof. I think some people call this love bombing and discarding. But they make the mistake of thinking that this behavior is intentional and designed to trick or manipulate people, when it often simply reflects a disorganized attachment style and an internal conflict between wanting love and being terrified to actually receive it. If you'd like to learn more about the relationships between these attachment styles and pathological narcissism, you can check out my doctoral dissertation. I'll put a citation in the description. I'm sure there are other factors that impact the availability of empathy in pathological narcissism and MPD. Dr. Romani's description is likely accurate for a small percentage of individuals, but I think most people with this disorder, and especially those who tend to present in a vulnerable way, suffer from a combination of the factors that I described in this video. Okay, so that's it for today. 
As always, leave questions, comments, and suggestions for future episodes below. And please also consider giving this video a like or a subscribe if you found it helpful. And until next time, take good care.